How were you brought into the faith? Now, I'm not looking for the short, trite theological answer of when I was baptized, although that's true. But I'm looking for a recollection in your own mind of the actual experience that corresponds to it. For example, it may have been that you were baptized as an adult, and so when you were given the gift of faith coincided also with your understanding of what you received. Or perhaps you were baptized as a small child, and the realization and understanding was not revealed to you fully of what you had received as a gift then until you were a little bit older. But we all had some point in our life, or will if it hasn't happened yet for you, where the realization of being in the presence of God through your relationship with Jesus becomes apparent, becomes something in some way revealed to you in a way that you understand. And often it can be an overwhelming realization one of overwhelming joy, but also just the reality of what God has done for you in Jesus really sinking in. And then you become aware that He has plans for you, as we sung about a little bit earlier in the service, that there was a definite plan, and that He's given you certain gifts, and that He is calling you to use those gifts in service to Him. Can you remember what it was like when you first had this realization, when you first understood that the things that you go about doing in your day-to-day life are not just simple menial tasks, but because of Jesus had been transformed into holy vocations which serve the God of the universe? Quite a thing to ponder. Now, pastors, whether this is fortunate or unfortunate for them, they often get asked this question, I think, more than most people. They're often asked, when did you realize you wanted to become a pastor? And I have to tell you, this was a tough question for me to contemplate growing up because I had heard so many answers of people like, oh, since I was four or five years old, and that was not my experience. My father was a pastor. And maybe that was partially why it was something I didn't really consider for myself. But this question is essentially when somebody asks you, they're asking you to recall, as I have asked you, the moment when you realized God was calling you to something. Now, some of you sitting in the pew today have asked me this question, whether it was first when I arrived here to serve as your pastor or since at some point in a conversation. And I would wager to say some of you might remember the answer I gave and some not. For me, it was a day where I got in a fight with my father, so much so that he called the school and said I wasn't coming in that day. And it just so happened to be the day that he goes once a month, he spent the whole day visiting his shut-ins, and so I went with him. And I got to see some of the things that a pastor does that even as somebody who's a member of a pastor's family doesn't really get to see. And on top of that, it just so happened that on that day, he had a visit that was unplanned for a friend of a member of the congregation who was on his deathbed, and it was the very first time I'd ever been in a situation like that. And getting to see what a pastor does in that situation sort of sealed the deal for me, even if in the moment I didn't quite fully realize it. Now, all this to say... We see this on display in sort of cosmic fashion in our Old Testament reading in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah 6 gives us an example of what the reality of the call from God does to a person. The specifics of the call are certainly different. You and I are not being called to be a prophet to the rebellious people of Israel in the Old Testament. But there are distinct similarities in what is being done to Isaiah in his relationship with God. Whether it's a call to be a parent, a doctor, a teacher, or insert, whichever vocation you like, there's a commonality to the experience of the unknowable, mysterious majesty of God communicating to us unworthy creatures. And this is on full display in Isaiah chapter 6. 
So I want you to think back to the time when you had this realization in your own life. Maybe it wasn't the inception of your faith, but the realization of what it meant, or what it brought to you, or what God was asking you to do with the gifts that He has given to you as we go through Isaiah 6. The initial confrontation between God and man is a frightful thing. And here I don't mean confrontation in the sense of a battle. If so, it would be the shortest battle in the history of battles. When one comes into the presence of God, you can safely say that's precisely the point the conflict is well and truly finished. Isaiah experiences this reality. Let me reread the first four verses of our Old Testament reading. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. Above Him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two He covered His face, with two He covered His feet, and with two He flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. I'd be pretty scared. I mean, at first when I read this the first time, I thought the foundation was shaking at the voice of God. But no, it's not even God. It's the seraphim who calls out, holy, holy, holy. So you can imagine what it would be like if God spoke. And when I first came to the realization that this might not be such a great experience was reading Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, and here's what he says. God is the only comfort. He is also the supreme terror, the thing we most need and the thing we most want to hide from. He is our only possible ally, and we have made ourselves His enemies. Some people talk as if meeting the gaze of absolute goodness would be fun. They need to think again. They are still only playing with religion. Goodness is either the great safety or the great danger, according to the way you react to it. And we have reacted the wrong way. We can say with certainty Isaiah was certainly feeling the truth of what Lewis says there, because we get to verse 5, and here's what he says. "'Woe is me, for I am lost.'" For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. The thrice called out holy God is in contrast to the despair of the sinner in His presence. Now, there are a couple of Hebrew words used that are translated woe, in Isaiah's woe is me. And one of them is much more severe, much stronger expression of despair, and that is the one used here. Isaiah is fully convinced he's in a place he has no business to be at, and that just by being here he has transgressed a boundary of holiness that will result in his destruction. He's acutely aware of his own sin and unworthiness and expresses that out loud. It's sort of like when you're caught doing something you know is wrong, that even a part of you agrees that you should be punished. Now just multiply that massively and you'll be a bit where Isaiah is at. Now I would wager that you haven't had such a vision as Isaiah describes here. But we do have moments that reflect the truth of what he's experiencing. Think back to the moment when you first became a spouse or when you first became a parent or maybe in your workplace being given a lot of new responsibilities. I know the first time I was ordained and then when I was installed at my first church and even here, my first thought was, who am I to serve in such a place? To take such an office, I like the the sacristy pair that Luther wrote. I have a, a framed version of it in our sacristy. And one of the things he expresses in there is that if this job was up to him alone, he would have ruined everything long ago. 
a recognition of unworthiness. We often understand this as an intimidation of a new responsibility, but what causes us to be intimidated is a nagging feeling that is, who am I to serve in such an office? Who am I to be given such a responsibility? Now, Isaiah is experiencing the ultimate form of this realization, standing in the presence of God, everything laid bare. There's no hiding now, nor is there for us. So how does our holy, holy, holy God, the Lord of hosts, respond to this transgression of a sinner entering into His courts? The Lord of hosts is merciful and not wrathful. He doesn't engage in the just judgment of Isaiah. Rather, He Himself removes the barrier of being in His presence. He purifies Isaiah. Verses 6 and 7 go quite like this. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Now notice God doesn't disagree with the expression of despair that Isaiah voices out loud. Everything Isaiah says is true. Everything he says about himself, everything he says about the people of God, he is indeed a man of unclean lips dwelling in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And the focus on lips as the imagery here gives us a clue into what God is calling Isaiah to do. He's calling him to be a prophet. And what does a prophet do but speak the word of the Lord? He's not fit to do such things. He's not fit to bear the word to the people of God, and so God makes him fit. God makes him worthy. He takes his unclean lips and purifies them from his altar and atones for the guilt so that he then can speak the word of the Lord. His guilt is taken away and his sin is atoned for. And when God calls each of us to our vocations, much the same occurs. God calls us to a task of which we feel unworthy. No matter the task He calls us to, now it is a job and service to Him, the King, the Lord of hosts. And we are not worthy to be even in His court, much less serve in it. And yet, He makes us worthy. He does what we cannot. From His altar, He purifies us. Today, you will receive the body and blood of Jesus on your lips, brought to you by the grace of the King and with, like for Isaiah, words that bring immense comfort, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. God is making you worthy to be His servant. And in our case, even more than that, now that Jesus, a beloved child of the Heavenly Father, has made a sacrifice in our place, He has given us His very relationship with God, and so we are no longer servants in His court, but beloved children brought into His family through the mystery and gift of baptism. But God isn't done yet. Let's hop back to the final verse of our Old Testament reading for today. Verse 8, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. Did you notice the transformation? Isaiah has gone from someone who despairs about being even in the presence of the King, the Lord of hosts, to one who is now able to answer his call. Before the grace and atonement of Isaiah's sin, he was petrified at being in the presence 
of a thrice holy God. The chasm couldn't have even been any bigger, right? Holy, holy, holy is the description of God, and the opposite of holy things are common things, but Isaiah doesn't even call himself a common thing. He calls himself unclean, the furthest thing from holy. He expects the justified wrath of God to destroy him. Yet after the forgiveness is given and he is made clean, he answers the call of God to be his prophet to his people. So it is with you as well. Whatever God has called you to do in service to him, you are unworthy, unclean. Whether that's to serve as a father, a mother, a husband, or a wife, a pastor, or a teacher, or a doctor, or whatever, because now you're doing it for the Lord, you're unworthy. Once God calls the work that's done in service to Him, unclean people have no place in His presence. God knows this. Driven by love and grace for you, just like for Isaiah, He forgives your sin and makes atonement for them all. So that when God calls, like Isaiah, you too, through the gracious gift of the Holy Spirit, can say, here am I, send me. May the grace of God, given freely as a gift to you, free you from fear and despair, and loosen your lips to answer His call. Who will go for us? And we say, here am I. Send me. In the name of Jesus. Amen.